Um, well, good afternoon. Um, please take your seats uh, and conclude your conversations. Um, my name is Scott Morris. I'm a uh, senior fellow here at the Center for Global Development. And it's uh, my great pleasure to be able to both introduce and host our um, distinguished speaker this afternoon, this rainy afternoon. Um, before I do that, I do want to use my prerogative as host um, to plug uh, an important new initiative we have here at the center. Um, just, just yesterday, um, CGD convened a high-level panel uh, to consider the future of the multilateral development banks and development banking. Um, it's a distinguished group uh, representing every region of the world. And it's very ably led by our three co-chairs, Montek Aluwalia, Arminio Fraga, and Larry Summers. Um, I can say the panel had a lively and productive discussion when they met yesterday. And I guess at this point, I would simply encourage you to go to our website, cgdev.org, uh, to learn more about the group's agenda. And then stay tuned for more information about uh, a final report in 2016. Um, now, I will note that it's, um, from my per perspective, it's a particularly interesting time for the panel's work. Um, to the surprise of many, uh, we seem to be entering a period of resurgence among the multilateral development banks. Uh, with new institutions, initiatives, and sources of demand for MDB financing, um, all pointing to an overall sense of renewed ambition. This stands in contrast to the mood just five years ago. Even as the G20 in Pittsburgh was promising new resources to enable the MDBs to lend aggressively into global crisis, that new money was tempered with a great deal more caution about uh, any future ambition for the banks. And I will say that nowhere was this more evident than at the World Bank, where a modest capital increase in 2010 came with an explicit message that the institution would actually be on a downward glide path such that lending would shrink in real terms before pre-crisis levels, below pre-crisis levels. Um, so what, if, what a difference a few years make. Today, the World Bank is lending at levels well above the pre-crisis years, and there's a great deal more talk about upward ambition than downward glide paths, um, particularly in this busy year of FFD, SDGs, and the Paris Summit. Um, so who better to make, help us make sense of this remarkable shift and the future direction of the institution than this afternoon's guest speaker. Sri Mulyani Indrawadi is the Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer for the World Bank, a position she's held since 2010. Um, in this role, she's responsible for the institution's operations in all regions, the new global practices, and the administrative vice presidencies and functions, so really pretty much everything. Um, Ms. Indrawadi previously served as a highly acclaimed <coughs> finance minister in Indonesia and prior to, to that, she led the country's National Development Planning Agency. Um, so clearly, her appointment at the World Bank was a win for the institution. And we'll talk more about how her prior role representing a bank client country has informed her work within the institution. Um, so uh, Ms. Indrawati will provide brief opening remarks, um, followed by a conversation with me here on the, the stage. And then um, we'll have um, some time for questions um, from all of you. Um, so I believe this is your first time speaking at the center. Um, so please join me in giving a warm CGD welcome uh, to Sri Milyani Indrawati. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much, Scott, for a very generous introduction and very warm welcome during this rainy day, it's, it's actually not really a good weather. So I'm surprised that the, the room's still very full. So I hope this is because of me, so that despite. So it's really a pleasure for me to be here in Center for Global Development. I heard a lot about this institution. I read a lot of their uh, publication, and many of them is really touching the very fundamental question about our institution, the, the World Bank. You all know that next week we are heading for our shareholder meeting, uh, the annual meeting of uh, the World Bank and IMF in Lima. So within the couple of days, I think you are not going to see many of the senior management and executive directors, and you will see many of the governors flying there. So let me share you a couple of points that maybe illustrate a little bit of the focus of our institu institution at this moment. The World Bank, as you know, is a 
an institution with 188 members countries. Part of them are purely shareholder, another part of them uh, are the borrower, but they are all members. So this is a very unique multilateral, very true multilateral institution. And I must say, if you compare with many other multilateral development uh, institution, or a bank, in this case, regional development bank, the bank has clear advantage of having a scope of global membership. But at the same time, you can imagine that this is, is going to be a very complicated institution to run and to govern and to manage. But uh, given the mandate as well as the membership of the bank, then you can easily predict that this institution will constantly adapt with the global context and with the client needs. There is two always constant thing that shape us, change us, in terms of the way we work, or even in this case, inventing the instrument or redesigning the engagement. That is the global context, changing the global context, and our client demands. And this is very healthy for us, because uh, uh, after joining the bank five years ago, I always have this kind of uh, always constant tension discussion within the management when there is a global agenda and then at the same time the client not necessarily immediately asking the same kind of engagement which is aligned with this global agenda. So the question about how to treat between the client demand and on the other hand also we also recognize that the global agenda is also very critical. So let me start with some of the global contexts which shape us today. First, the global economy. Of course, everybody knows that today, especially this year, the mood is really different. If you compare with the 2005 when I again joined the bank, at that time, many emerging developing countries was very confident that they say to the world that, well, we are actually strong enough so we can withstand the financial crisis globally. We're even stronger. We explain the global growth uh, quite significantly and the rise of many emerging countries in terms of the voice, standing, or even then saying about the leadership in the global economic um, fora. Today, I think we see a totally different with the weakening of the China economic growth. We see many other emerging countries, whether you talk about Brazil, Mexico, Turkey, my own country, Indonesia. We are all, I think, now speaking with a lot of humility in a way. And, and the advanced country is not really that good also. I mean, although we see the European recovery or at least a little bit much more stable, hopefully will be continue. The only bright spot may be the United States in which the recovery is there. Even the Japan, which actually allowing to have this the reform under the Prime Minister Abe, they still struggle to recover and continue um, in the path of growth. So that definitely shaped the agenda this, this year, especially. But if you combine this with the oil price and the commodity price, or even food price, because again, what these five years make a lot of difference. When I joined the bank, we are talking about food crisis because of the very high food crisis. Three years ago, the bank annual meeting, the theme is about the food crisis and the food. And today, we are talking all commodity, or including food prices, actually declining quite significantly. And that's changed quite a lot in terms of our client situation. 30% of the poor live in oil exporting countries. Just a couple of years ago, I know that my country team in Angola said that they are never actually borrowed the bank. We have a lot of revenue coming from the oil. We have plenty of money. And just this year, we just actually passing one of our uh, budget support combined with the reform in Angola. But Angola is oil exporting country, and you can predict Nigeria which is another country after the election, which we have intensified our uh, uh, discussion with them about what kind of program under the new government that we are going to support. What is another global context that shaped us? Uh, Scott men mentioned about the Paris summit, climate change. This is, has been uh, the, the big issue that we are, uh, see as a very important 
not only within the global context, but the nature of the problem, which is cannot be actually contained in one country border. This is a global issue, and that's why there are quite a lot uh, of uh, area of engagement that we are going to do with the client. Currently, we have 11.9 billion portfolio within our uh, 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 lending program at, uh, for 77 countries, more than 220 projects which is actually in the area of climate change. And we expect this is going to grow because both the recognition at the global level, but most importantly is because many of our client countries also demanding our engagement in this area. What is another example? I think it's just a couple of months ago, you know very well, because here in the United States is also a headline, Ebola, the pandemic. There's also another thing that we are going to be like to see as a trigger by a situation or crisis, and then we are responding, not only in terms of supporting the client country, but in this case, addressing the issue as much structural and systemic, for example, like the health system, with the emergency needs to create or to lessen, what you call it, the damaging impact of this uh, uh, pandemic to the three country, but also to the West Africa in, in general. And of course, this year you are all knows very well that this is the 2015 is the finishing line of the MDG and the starting line of the SDG this week, in fact. And this is the seven, 17 goals which is declared in the SDG. It's coincide with not only our two goals, but also with the way we design our structure within the bank that will enable us to support and, and actually work. And the last thing, which is within the context of uh, the global environment, or in this case, the, the issue on related to development is the refugee and the migrant crisis. The discussion about that, not only that we within the bank, we already recognized, and that's why the work of the fragile and conflict state in the bank has become our one cross-cutting solution, but this is a new, a, a, a constant challenge for the institution like us, which dealing with the fragility or with, they then have the implication on this refugee, which cannot be approached with one dimension only. Even, and in this case, the partnership with many other institutions is be becoming critical. So I must say that this is really a, a, an example, but it's a very obvious example of how the institution like the World Bank actually work, it's always constantly adapt and adopt from what we call it the global environment on global context or challenge, whether this is in the form of the global public goods or global public bad, up to the client demand. And the comparative advantage of the institution like the World Bank that we operate in many other and in many countries, our presence in many of the client country make us have, the, enable us to be able to engage, to understand, to communicate continuously, then to respond to both the client demand, but at the same time, we also understand that we are a global institution and that's why link it this two within the way we engage with the client. I think that is going to be something which is fair for me to give you a little bit more or less the perspective but at the same time, also the theme that you are going to see during this annual meeting. Uh, with that, maybe I'm going to just stop here because I know that Scott is going to, to invite you all to ask me a lot of questions. Um, but as I said, I think within the Washington here, a lot of discussion about the World Bank in um, so many different fro uh, form and issue, whether this is related to the bank chains, the bank financing, the existence of the new institution like AIB. So I look forward to have a discussion with you all in this afternoon. Thank you again for inviting me here. So I do promise they will get to ask questions, but first I ask questions. Uh, so, um, well, thank you. That was a very nice context for um, uh, the upcoming annual meetings in Lima. Um, 
I was thinking Lima next weekend, but as you noted, it, this is really starting all week for you next week with the G20, the IMFC, and, um, uh, and of course the development committee. Could you tell us maybe a little bit more specifically for the bank, I, what should we be looking for coming out of Lima? What are your priorities, uh, whether it's specific decisions or um, you know, areas of emphasis among uh, the bank's governors and, and um, you know, w w what outcomes are, should we be looking for? Well, this is, as I said, is the, the shareholder, but also the, the client engagement uh, during the, the annual meeting. So the first, for sure, is actually for us to present to, present to our shareholder where we are at this year in terms of our work and what is the policy priority for, for the bank. This year, as I said, is a very uh, special one because we have the SDG. So they are going to ask about what, what, what is the compatibility of this the commitment by the head of state on the SDG with the bank own mission, goals, and the way we operate. I think that's going to be one of the theme which is coming from that. And within that SDG, of course, you know, derived from that is how you are going to finance and how the bank as an institution is going to contribute within the context of that. And that resource is going to be something which is very critical. The second one in the, uh, on the annual meeting, we are going to also discuss about the climate change. This is going to be a separate, uh, which is going to be hosted by us jointly with the friends, which is related not only the recognition of the climate change problem, but the financing side but also again. The commitment of institutions like us in terms of how we are going to carry this issue or the, the goals within our engagement with our client. And that's why looking at the way we are operate and what engagement, whether this is on a mitigation, adjust, uh, uh, adaptation is going to be very critical. But this week, I think we are going to expect, and this is already being reported by all our regional VP, so the client country is going to ask many of the new engagement because of their global economic challenge. Many oil exported, commodity exporting country is going to ask the program. Uh, we have from, I mentioned about Angola, but many other is going to like discuss about what kind of support, whether you're talking about the dollar lending or in terms of what kind of program that they want us to support. This is usually linked, if it is budget support, then usually linked to their ambition to reform because structural reform is becoming very even more important when you are dealing with the slowing down of the economy. And then of course, Many other countries, this is will include Ukraine, I think many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, but I just visited India that they are going to bring this issue. And then a lot of issue related to the issue of uh, the future of the bank, because um, the World Bank is in the cycle of the voice reform, and uh, the, the, gov the board of directors is talking about how we are going to do the next cycle of this voice reform, which is, I think, has been decided in terms of the path in the next two years. And within that context, of course, this is on IBRD, but we also close to the IDA replenishment. This is going to be our final years for next year, and this is going to be starting of the replenishment of the IDA. So that is going to be the area that you are going to see on the most of the discussion. Couple of maybe specific issue because as I mentioned earlier about the, the refugee and migrant. The MENA region is going to have a one specific dedicated session which is going to discuss with both the Gulf country, client country, but also the, the G7 and uh, plus uh, that is going to discuss about how we are going to respond to the crisis uh, which is happening today. And maybe we'll, um, from the audience, get to hear more uh, other questions about that. I think it's very interesting. Um, yeah. Let me stick with uh, sort of the high level here and, so, and come back to something I, I said in my opening, which is it is striking um, if you look at the numbers for the bank um, and look back to the period before the global financial crisis, um, both the numbers and frankly, I think a lot of the mood at the time was more um, questioning um, bank relevance going forward. Was there really demand among um, the bank's borrowers going forward? And then of course you had the crisis uh, the bank played um, 
uh, a very one of the central <laughs> roles in crisis response among international organizations. Um, but it, frankly, I think the surprise is that where we are today, um, and, and looking at these numbers of bank lending, IBRD, IDA, is um, they're quite high. Um, there's really, um, you know, as an expression of demand, I suppose it, it seems that countries. Um, uh, are looking more to the bank today than we might have expected, certainly before the crisis. So what, what is going on there um, in, in terms of the attitude of your client countries, the bank's approach? Um, I, I assume this is a good thing. I, from my perspective, it is. But uh, what, what's your perspective? Well, I'm glad you asked this question, Scott. I mean, again, I joined the bank five years ago as a former finance minister. and. The issue at that time, I mean, we just landed 2010, right? The 2009, we landed around very high. I think close even 40 billion because of the crisis, finan global financial crisis, that all country asking to do the counter cyclical and they are doing to really buffering. So it's an exceptional. And even at that time, um, there is a new instrument which is introduced because I was the one who asked at that time as a client, as a finance minister, I really don't need the money now, but I really want to calm down the market, which is so panicked, looking at me while the problem in the United States. So how can you help me? So I asked what they call it the uh, drawdown, which is depend on whether the market is really so volatile that I really need to draw down that kind of lending. So deferred drawdown instrument was introduced. This is something which the bank is at best. When the client asking, and I challenged them at that time, I need this kind of instrument. I really don't need that now because my deficit is not going to increase, but the market is so wild, it's so unpredictable. I need them to calm down, and in that, in that kind of situation, having an institution like the bank beside me is going to calm down the market, saying that we have other alternative source of financing so you better behave because I have another source of financing if I need it. That really creates a, a better conversation with, with the market uh, if you are a regular bond issuer. And many of Sub-Saharan Africa now is becoming the first timer in reg, uh, bond issuer when they are doing the deficit financing. And that's another new phenomena that we really need to watch. But this is exactly how we see that the bank is always responding. At that time, we increased, and of course, you know very well, Scott, that our capital, the equity, is not really increased. You only increased very slightly at that time. So you can easily predict bits on your balance sheet if you use that lending so much in one particular year, within the next year, you are going to drop. The prediction at that time is not even 15 billion, it's 10 billion, and I said, okay, 10 billion is so small. I think I can take a lot of vacation in this case. <laughs> and then, and not only that, the constraint within the bank, but also the environment globally is also creating that kind of perception that the demand is no longer there. Why? Because you flush the global economy with liquidity. The United States, the Euro, the interest rate suddenly become almost close to zero. And so many countries suddenly, it's so easy to go to the market. Just 2009, 2010, the market was so volatile, they are just punishing all the country. And then suddenly now they're asking, can you issue bond? I will buy any bond, anything from any country. So we really, in this case, we talk about the financing, it's competing. And that's why the gloomy thinking that, well, the bank, um, it's not really cheap because I actually can borrow from from the market equally cheap or almost cheap, they are still slightly higher, or some of them significantly higher. But they don't want to have the hurdle of this conditionality, the reform, or even in this case, if it is investment lending, the, the policy of the procurement, safeguard, and so on. So why should I, I have to deal with the bank? Why can't like, we go to the market easily? When the market come, a lot of plenty of, I think it's just almost like predictable that they will say that the bank will no longer need it. But that's not the case. I mean, we have a little bit slide down in the almost going down below 20. When I took over the whole, the this chief operating officer position in which uh, oversee both the region and the network, 
And we also changed within the bank, the organization. I said that you can complain a lot of things about the change in the bank, but we cannot sacrifice our client needs. So focus on that, talk with the client, and don't export our internal problem to the client. If I were the finance minister, I don't want to hear about whether you change or not. That's your problem. I have a lot of problems myself in my own country, right? So we tell the, the stuff that we are not exporting our internal problem. We are there to listen. And that really helped a lot during this transition. And that created quite a lot of confidence and the engagement that the bank really listened to them, look at them. And so when the global economy changed again, from plenty of liquidity to become a uh, taper tantrum with all this maybe normalization of that create another mood of the market. You can see that the, the client feel that we have institution like bank who always there for me. That kind of relationship is the, the most valuable one. And we have become a trusted partner. We want to be useful. We want to provide. And we support it not in a spoiled way. We support in a constructive way. We use that kind of entry, especially when they need us to push reform further, to bring something that will stronger strengthen their foundation. I think that really may be the best thing for the bank. So I must say that, yes, the bank, because we are still governed with our balance sheet, which is constrained by the capital or the equity that we are having, there is always a maximum, uh, the financing volume that we could lend. But the bank is not only a lending-borrowing relationship. We have a non-lending engagement with many countries. And that's become the new business that we are having. And many countries, many regions now asking for what you call it, the rest that is the technical assistance knowledge product, which we are working very closely with them. OK. If we stay with this a little bit, so um, you described in your remarks the what are increasingly clearly downside risks in the global economy, and even more specifically among your, um, some of your major clients. Um, so this, you know, the, the word crisis starts to arise, and I, I'm, I'm struck. I, I have in my head that in the movie theaters right now, there's this film called Our Brand is Crisis, and I don't expect that that's the motto you want the bank to adopt. Um, but um, it, is, it is a moment where, you know, we look at this institution, and and think about both your role in helping clients manage downside risks, and then when the moments do arise where we have crisis, and we of course had a spectacular moment in, in the late 2000s, and, and the bank um, very visibly played uh, a scaled up role. What, what are the lessons from that period, and frankly a period you know, in the years subsequent where um, there's been fragility? Um, how much is the bank an important partner, and, and in what ways specifically um, uh, are you helping these countries, particularly the large ones? Well, um, the pattern of the demand from the large emerging country is totally different if you compare with the client country, the, whether this is a small state, small island state, or even in this case, the low income countries. So the best, as I said earlier on my op opening, is that the fact that the bank presence in the country, we will be able to always adjust the way we engage. For a big emerging country, whether you talk about Brazil or Turkey or Indonesia, Mexico, China even in this case, and India, which I just visited last week, I think they're talking more on at the federal or central national level. If you talk with their finance minister people, with our staff bank, I think they're comparable. So they don't have any differences in terms of, oh, I understand the macroeconomy. I, I know the budget, I know the deficit, I, 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 I know how to finance, how to run. Maybe they, in this case that, oh, we have a little bit more challenge on transferring funding to the local government. Many of the national governments see that now the local government, that is the state level or provincial level, is the one who need reform. And sometimes they really need us to use the bank to introduce reform at the local level, whether this is related to the service delivery, whether this is related to the local public finance. So you, you see that one thing which I see as a new innovation, because before, I think the bank is not lending to the sub sovereign state. That is the new thing, introduction of the P4R. 
because many of the emerging country or the, even the low income country, they want to use their own country system. And so you, we use the P4R that is program for result in which we use our financing a little bit, crowding in a little more on their own budget and we influence the whole system. I think that is the thing that we are now seeing as, as a most important pattern. China is a little bit different. With the, they use us, especially when they are going to pilot a certain thing, whether this is on urbanization, health, or in climate change, in this case, with the pollution. They introduce it in one specific state or even city. And if they see it as work, not only in terms of the project itself, but sometime with the other, like the system coming with the project, then they are going to be able to replicate to others. India, which I just visited last week, at the state level is really different, whether you are talking about the, again, urbanization is going to be like the big, inclusiveness has become the really, really big issue. Whether you are talking about the gender, or you are talking about the, the caste system, or they are talking about how you are going to make sure that the design of their program. Another thing in India, which is really different last week when I visited there, is each state is actually talking about how to attract business. So they are talking about the doing business indicator, which is I surprised because I come from Indonesia, a little bit upset with the doing business sometimes with the indicator there. Oh my God, my country is still there and thing we are going to, I try to improve. This time they never actually protest about the indicator. They are not never asking about the methodology, the data. They're saying, why my state is in a seven or eight? I think that my state is supposed to be in a top three comparing to the other states. So there is really a change of the mindset. I think that is exactly what we are doing with many of the emerging countries, that they are actually in their driver's seat. The bank was seen as an institution who can provide according their very specific need. And then we adjusted whether in terms of instrument, whether this is in terms of the interaction. Uh, so this is what, what we are doing, Scott. Good. So let me um, let me shift course a little bit. You had a um, a blog on Huffington, Huffington Post. I think it was last week on uh, the issue of corruption and, and anti-corruption efforts. And um, you point to the Sustainable Development Goal number sixteen, and uh, you know the it asks us to promote just, peaceful, and inclusive societies by building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. And um, I think it's a strong piece, and, and I think fundamentally, you know, the argument is pretty unassailable. But I do want to push you a little bit on what it means operationally for the bank and, and this sort of the anti-corruption agenda and the language around zero tolerance for corruption. And mm -hmm. of course, you know, no one would say, well, the bank ought to have a little tolerance for corruption. It's not so. <laughs> that is not where I'm going with this. But. Um, you know, uh, there, there is an issue of, you know, the bank has to operate in the world as it is, and you are often operating in difficult environments in, in uh, many different countries. And there's a question of risk tolerance uh, when it comes to choices you make with projects, sectors, countries. And I do wonder how you can balance, how you manage to balance um, a strong message and policies on zero tolerance that doesn't become zero risk. In, in your approach operationally. So could you talk about that a little bit? Well, again, uh, yesterday I, I just attended the farewell for E4 tier. This is our chairman of the sanction board. He's already served for three years. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm glad that you asked this question because yesterday I've already rehearsed this kind of <laughs> 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 Same question which is asking about. I think I will try to approach into two ways. First, internally within the bank, and uh, second is uh, on a client side again. Within the bank, if you talk about zero tolerance of corruption, it doesn't mean that you are not going to be ex not exposed to this. But the question is about do you have mechanism in place that making sure that if you land, whether you are in the whole process, the design of your project, the whole process from the design, procurement, implementation, disbursement, that money is going to be allocated according to the plan, rule, and not actually being corrupted. So it's really about the assurance of the mechanism within the bank. And in this case, as an institution, we learn a lot. We, we improve a lot in terms of the way we do. I think 
making sure that the project will not be corrupted. And if it is being corrupted, whether this is from the contractor who have to pray, bribe, or even involving our own staff, there is mechanism within the bank. We have, after now eight years, our sanction system, which is uh, consists of two tiers in this case. Internally, if there is a company which is being caught, committed to the corruption, we have an investigation by our IMT. We put it with an OSD. They will issue the decision. If they don't accept it, they can challenge it in our sanction system. So it's a very robust eight years. I know firsthand after five years because INT, OSD, and uh, the sanction board is more or less in terms of the administrative reporting is under me. So I know the evolution in the past five years is just very impressive. They accumulate quite a lot of what you call it reputation. If you talk about the department, it's no longer that the company debarred from the bank, but it is debarred across other multilateral development. The punishment of the cor committing corruption for any contractors or company is going to be very severe. And now they're becoming very aware. And that's created quite a lot of very important dynamic. So that within the bank, that is within the bank, if there is a corruption, we have a mechanism to address. Or even before corruption happened, we, ha we want to make sure that it will be prevented. That's including within the INT that they share the knowledge to all our TTL, our project leaders, in order for them to know who's the company who's within our high profile race on a corruption. So that kind of mechanism is being built within the bank. Now with the clients a little bit different. Coming from Indonesia, you know very well, we are not really proud if you talk about the cleanness and uh, in this case, Suharto was actually uh, forced down because of the corruption, of course. So dealing with the client country, of course, the bank will push the reform through many of our program that we are engaged with them. From the very upstream, for example, like transparency and openness of the budget. We never lending to any country if they are not open the budget. I think that is totally different approach. I know during Suharto time in, 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 uh, in New Order, that is 30 years ago, the bank lent a lot to Indonesia, and, and we really don't know because I think the budget never been published. Now we are not going to do that for any country. But publishing and transparency is only one thing. We want to make sure that public finance management is going to be improved. We even empower the client feedback. We open it, in this case, the benefiting feedback. So it's a lot of change if you compare with, with many years ago. And then, then, of course, corruption is not only about how to collect money in a public and how the civil servant is going to do it. It's also judicial system within the country. And that is an area which always creates a lot of debate within the bank. Is it still within the mandate of bank or not? Because you know very well, uh, Scott, before James Wolfson, our previous president, the word corruption never actually discussed in the bank. It was seen that this is beyond the mandate of the bank, which is need to be purely on economic, social. And they said the corruption related to anything with political, you should not touch. That is the mandate of the bank. So the debate about what is actually still within the economic, social development area, and what is the area which is political, which you are not having a mandate to touch it. And you talk about the corruption judicial system, they always like talking about this may be a little bit political. So this is the area which is, we are going to be struggle, but we will use all our leverage, instrument, and engagement. I think INT is working very closely with many of the anti-corruption agency. You talk about uh, Ukraine now, but I know about Indonesia after Suharto fell. We have the new anti-corruption commission. This is empowered by many of the support, including by the bank and by the INT investigative audit, forensic audit. This is something which they never have that kind of capacity that will be very important for them to have. So we'll try to do in many different forms, from our side as well as on the client side. Okay, so one more topic and then we will go to the audience for questions. Um, so Pope Francis cast a long shadow and uh, with his visit last week, it was less evident in the press that there was another visit uh, with uh, President Xi um, and uh, even less evident um, in terms of coverage was that, that uh, in, in the normal fashion there was an economic statement put out by the U.S. and China 
um, uh, as part of the visit. Um, it's a remarkable thing um, when it comes to the multilateral development banks and the World Bank. And you know, I'll ask you to to talk about the substance, but um, in the currency of official channels, what struck me most was the number of words on the page and the <laughs> priority uh, in, in the sense that the discussion of the MDBs came first on the list. And, and there was, um, you know, I think a full page and a half devoted mm -hmm. to MDB issues. So this is uh, really striking to me that your largest shareholder, the United States, and your third largest shareholder, China, um, had something to say uh, jointly about the multilateral development banks and about your institution. So I wonder um, if you could offer some reaction there and, and what it means both in substance, but then what it means um, in your governance. Uh, you know, do we, are we seeing sort of a, uh, an alliance uh, among these two uh, unlikely shareholders? Well, it's really encouraging. It's, I mean, I'm extremely happy. You're right, one and a half page, the first even in this case, the discussion between President Obama and uh, President Xi Jinping about the MDB or even within the bank, uh, the World Bank as a present good institution. It's, uh, so having the largest shareholder talking about us in the way that they not questioning about the relevant, but they want them to even more, is actually reflecting first that they recognize that <sighs> Multilateral institution is not a substitute of bilateral. How big your country is, how powerful you are, you cannot do it alone. I mean, the world is becoming so complicated. It's a lot of issues beyond one country. And for the sake of effectiveness and legitimacy, having multilateral institution is really more complementary to whatever that you have the global goal that you want to achieve. So being recognized like that is really, for me, is a very delighted. I mean, I, I am a very, I'm a true believer of multilateralism in a way. And then the second one, not only that they recognize us, but they say they want to make us relevant. And that may, may be implicitly, explicitly, maybe you know better from your own experience, Scott, I do hope, that they are going to be willing to put more resource. I mean, if you talk about the size of the bank, of course, the question about the relevance of the bank is no longer about whether you play a role in one specific crisis, one specific issue. But you also talk about the size. And of course, then everybody can easily compare the bank operation versus the new, like AIIB. So I think this is just a very good indication, and our board is already discussing it. They have a timeline to talk about this voice reform, um, the legitimacy as well as the effectiveness, and our ability to operate is really depend on how our shareholder will see us and want to use us, and how we, on the one hand, on the other hand, have to show that we are good managed, good governed, we are efficient, we are accountable. I think that is more or less, and, and I think now the bank with all the reform that we are having, we are aiming for that. We want to become the institution with it, that fit for the purpose, for the objective, the goals that we declare. We want to make sure that we are better governed, uh, better managed, efficient, and accountable. So, so I think that is more or less mutual. I think the signal is just showing that you have to do it better, you have to manage it better, you have to be more effective so that not only the shareholder, but most importantly, our, sh our client, and even more importantly, the poor people will really get the benefit of this institution. Okay. All right, so let's go to questions. We should have microphones. Uh, yes, so there will be microphones. Would you prefer one at a time or take a few? A few, maybe. Okay, so let's do that. We'll start. Right here in front. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project. And um, I was reading the president's speech today about um, poverty and shared prosperity. And I was just struck that his approaches or his diagnosis was very, very different than 
the, the whole discourse around solidarity economy and the kinds of bottom-up decentralized processes that Indonesia has implemented with its very, very strong community-driven programs. And I, I'm just wondering how, we, how the bank can bridge that gap between these seemingly very top-down approaches, you know, including some really good ones, investments in health and education and insurance, and, the, and stimulating the kind of bottom-up processes that actually do reduce poverty and inequality. Okay, a few others. I think right over here, and then maybe someone over back here. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Frank Vogel. I'm with a group called Transparency International. And I maybe misheard you, so I wonder if you could be quite precise on something you just said. You seem to suggest that there is a question in the bank about judicial reform in terms of corruption. I've never heard that before from the bank, and I was involved in pressing Jim Wolfenson in the early 90s. Um, impunity is a crucial factor. If the bank is not willing to go after the issue of impunity, then surely most of what you're saying about corruption is just rhetoric. And let me just add, We've just had our annual meeting of TI members from over 100 countries. And I asked many of them about their consultation on the ground with the bank. And they say that it's non-existent, that the bank's claims to involve civil society in consultations, at least as far as Transparency International is concerned, is non-existent. And that the rhetoric on corruption and the reality of what the bank does is a huge gap and so I wonder if you could be precise on what you meant when you said that issues of judiciary are somehow borderline or questionable. Thank you. And yes, right here. Uh, thank you. I'm Paul Cadario from the University of Toronto and formerly at the bank. Um, I wanted to uh, inquire about uh, the question of human rights. Um, I'm sure the bank will be preparing a very studied uh, analysis in response to uh, Philip Alston's uh, report, which he issued last week. Uh, but I'm interested in hearing perhaps a preliminary view of how his report affects the bank's uh, continuing conversation about modernization of safeguards, of which human rights uh, have been pushed, and Professor Alston has certainly made a, a considerable uh, contribution to the discussion. And also, in terms of the modernization of the bank, which after all is a uh, post-World War II institution when a lot of the you know, issues of governance legitimacy were quite different from the 21st century uh, and how the bank wants to achieve the twin goals in the SDGs. Thank you. Okay, there's three di very okay. different questions. So. I think the first one, the, the approach of the bank in which there is always two things first, which is bottom up and you mentioned about CBD coming from Indonesia, I know that uh, this is one of the invention we want to circumvent, especially when you are dealing with a very corrupt regime at that time, versus the one which is top down. I think they both always exist in a way, and the bank will look at th this as a, within the context of what, what is the program. The, the CDD, or in this case, the social protection which we are actually has been escalating, especially since the food crisis four years ago. And that is really just to not only advising, but supporting many of the client country, especially during the most vulnerable time, the poor is going to suffer more. And for any country, you don't have to wait until you are rich to have the social protection system. So we start and we really like strengthening and scaling up a lot of our social protection program, which is most of them is also in the form of strengthening the CDD. But this is not a substitute of the government role, especially when it is related to the basic services and also the accountability of the government. 
So in a way that the bank also using our engagement, sometimes dealing with the government in strengthening, I know one or two, which is I still remember because I chair the OC, that they using like the P4R, this is the new instrument in which we use our money, but at the same time using the country own system. The money that the bank put is usually is not that big. The, their own budget money is big. One is it like the example in Vietnam. This is related to the water services. And then, then we are going to influence the whole system. And that is exactly what we are doing by saying that on the one hand, the government has to have the functioning, the effectiveness in order for them to be able to provide especially basic services for the poor. But on the other hand, the community can organize this themselves and they can be strengthened through this kind of what you, you call it CDD type activity, which can be supported by our resources also and also even link and learn from many other uh, different countries. Because I must say, the CDD in each country, even within the Indonesian uh, experience, what in a Java island is different from outside Java island. So th that may be the, the answer. So I don't see the speech of President Kim, which is especially telling about the sharing prosperity, the need for a government to be able to not only protect, uh, but also ensure the poor and also strengthening especially and the health system but education also is going to be very critical in addressing the, uh, the poverty so I don't see it as really like this against that or this is opposing to others but this is more like a complementary the second I think I'm glad that you asked because I don't want to give you the impression that the bank is not engaged what I'm saying is that the interpretation about anything which is seen as a political is always create a question whether the bank has the mandate to go there. But in judicial reform, the bank worked with some other country. I know in my legal counsel, Anne-Marie Leroy, that we have a division of the legal and our governance global practice. We have a, a program which is supporting many of the judicial reform or judicial system within the, 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 the country. Um, I'm not sure in this case with the TI why they don't have any interaction with the bank. But I think uh, telling that the bank is just rhetoric in the anti-corruption, that's uh, a bit harsh. Because I know very well that, I mean, with, with, with our, my own experience, and Scott, you asking earlier about the reputation risk. The question with the bank is always that when you are in a country, especially the country with a lot of corruption, when you are going to say that this is reaching a limit in which you are compromising a lot, or when you are going to just pull and giving the signal. And I must say there is really a real, a real case. When we feel at that time that the corruption has been too systematic from top to bottom, that it is impossible for us to operate in that particular sector, for example, or project, without, without being compromised, even when we have the system to make sure that the project is clean, we are not really sure that this is not going to be compromised. At that particular situation, we are going to say, no, we are not going to finance, we are going to stop. I think that's happened uh, in one or two cases, I don't know whether I should mention it, but I, I must say that we did that. We make that kind of decision. But Scott mentioned that at the same time, you always question yourself, not engaging with the countries. You can be like reputation free because you are saying that you are not going to run any reputation risk. But then you are not going to have any opportunity to also have a certain influence. So that kind of question is a constant discussion that we are having. Many of the chairing of the operating before we put it on the board is this kind of risk that I have to ask to my team when we are dealing with this kind of situation, whether you have, based on your professional judgment, assessment about who's the reformist, what nature of the risk, that we are sure 
by putting this resource and this program, we can push a certain benefit on this good governance or strengthening institution. Or we think that this is too risky that this change will not make any difference, but we are going to face a lot of huge risk on the reputation being associated with a certain regime or a certain, I mean, this is exactly, this is the most difficult part because if I give a signal to the staff that this is too risky, don't touch it, then all my staff is going to just go into the safest place, the cleanest place, the partner which is totally easy, and you don't want to push to the area which is maybe a little bit gray, but maybe you can push a little bit and you can introduce with a certain risk that you are going to run with that kind of engagement. But this is development. This is exactly that kind of question that you should ask, I will ask, I will talk to my team, we discuss with the client, we are also telling our shareholder. And that is exactly what we are making, what you call it calculated risk, but we want to make sure that if we are going to engage, there is a robust judgment, analytical, that we are make sure that what we are doing is actually will push the reform ahead, will make maybe a little bit then, not really like you are claiming that you can clean up all the whole. So that is maybe, I mean, this is a constant battle in terms of the way we work. But I, I want to give you an assurance that this is not rhetoric. For the bank, it's really a matter whether you have a chance to push the reform, there is an opportunity there, there is a partner in which we feel confidence that we can work with them and push this agenda forward. Paul, I really don't want to comment any report which is still there, and I, I actually don't know yet uh, at this moment. But you know very well that many uh, the, the, the process of reforming our safeguard is still ongoing. We are now consulting with all our client country and shareholder and stakeholder based on the draft that is already being agreed or at least being allowed by the board for us to make that kind of consultation. And within that kind of draft of the safeguard, a lot of issue is very critical. And this is again, this is really the issue for all of us, multilateral institutions like us is going to face with one that we believe in a sound, good principle, universal, global. And at the same time, this is exactly my conversation last week in India, that they are asking Sri Mulyani, if you are going to design a safeguard policy as such, that we even in one state, which is very well, uh, what you call it, capable, I cannot implement that kind of policy so what is the point of having a good, very sound policy but cannot be implemented? But this is real conversation that we should have. And that's why this consultation is going to happen. We are going to consult 133 countries in the next six months. We are going to meet them. We will talk with the government official, the project officer, which is our counterpart, if we are going to have this kind of safeguard policy with this kind of requirement, whether you are talking about the human right, you're talking about the labor standard, you're talking about non-discriminatory, we're talking environmental, this is going to be the project design that we are going to do. Okay, they say that sometimes they say that I have no argument because my own law is actually recognizing that. But now if you are going to really put it within the context of the design of the project, this have a certain implication. Whether this is a time to prepare the project, the ability of the government to do it, and then you are going to really discuss about the real thing. That is, is it really implementable or not? Or what kind of formulation within this policy that make and allow us to have a sound principle, but at the same time making sure that this project and the client country can implement that one. I think this is going to be more or less the stand at this moment, and I'm not going to to make any what statement that is going to like damage the process of this consultation 
because I truly, really want to hear from all, both our shareholder, our stakeholder, our client, about how the bank is going to design or redesign our safeguard that will enable us as an institution to have a good sound principle, but at the same time, we are going to be able to still continue working with the client and addressing the issue of many things, infrastructure, health, education. Okay, let's take another round. Um, right here in front, and then here, here. My name is Charles Frank. I used to be at the EBRD, among other places. And um, I was really struck by your uh, outline of the global issues that you have to deal with and adapt to, uh, such as climate change, Ebola, etc. But uh, I'm really curious, could you give us some specific uh, things that the bank can do on the migrant problem, the migrant issue? What, what is your response uh, to that particular problem? And then we'll go right, right here. Uh, thank you. I'm Cinnamon Dornsife. I'm from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And I, among other places, used to be at the ADB. So I'm curious about the parameters that you would um, suggest for co-financing and collaborating between MDBs, and in particular the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, as they look to um, collaborate together on meeting the vast infrastructure needs in that region. Thank you. And then I do one more. I'll, I'll come to this side later. <laughs> right here. Thank you. Uh, this is Ozan Çakmak from International Labor Organizations, but in Turkey, not here. Uh, so uh, my question is that as um, um, achieving SDGs and mitigating the impact of the climate change uh, will require enhanced collective efforts, which is very much emphasized in the consultations process last couple of years. So how it will affect the way the World Bank operate and collaborate with the, not only with the international organizations, but also governments and also non-governmental <coughs> actors, uh, because as we know that SDGs uh, were very much uh, engaging the uh, communities to do uh, different uh, channels to really uh, vocal what are the real needs for the new development era. Thank you very much. The migrant issue. I think we are not going to claim that the bank really know exactly, but because of uh, the nature of the work that we are now having, uh, whether you're talking about Jordan, which is uh, to be receiving a lot of refugees from Syria. And we work with them, yeah, especially on this specific location on the border, which really creating a huge burden for the local government. I mean, the, the number of the refugee is even now bigger than their local population. So you can see that the competition on the use of the public services education, health, or even on, on other. So we design a certain program at that time for Jordan, really channeling for this local government in order for them to be able to deal and mitigate. Lebanon is also the same thing, although I must say this is really a more challenging environment on the government side because the, 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 the role or the functioning of the government is there. Turkey is not really asking too much of our engagement on that, but I think we know that it is huge, almost two million there. So I guess what we offer at this moment is that the bank is not unlimited in terms of the resource. We are not having unlimited resource. So for Jordan, the dilemma even in this case, is not fair for them because we use the allocation of the resource which is supposed to be for Jordan to borrow from us, now has been used for dealing with this. And within our balance sheet, this is still calculated the exposure to the Jordan. And of course, lending to Jordan, there is a maximum exposure that we allow according to our prudential regulation. So that's become an issue that if a country exposed by a, an issue which is beyond their control or become like a public bad, 
and that's become their cause. How the institution like us? So uh, this migration issue creating a lot of challenging question for us as an institution to operate. And this is I'm talking about within the bank own. But we, as I said earlier, this migration is not purely bank. I mean, the way we we operate in Iraq, we also have to deal quite a lot with UN. I mean, even in Afghanistan, when I'm, I'm there, I visited there. This is really another challenging environment in which you are dealing with, not only in terms of whether our resources, our instrument, our modality of engagement will fit with the need that they're having. But sometimes we really also cannot do it alone. We, we need sometimes UK, United States, United Nations, especially on the area that really collaborate with us in order for us to be able. So on a migration, the current situation, the team, especially the MANA team, working closely with our finance, we try to think about how we can mobilize maybe additional resources, which is not within our, but this is still too early for me to, to say. We are going to share this with our shareholder and some of the, uh, the, the grouping country, like the Gulf uh, and European, as well as the, as I said, the G7. And then maybe we are going to develop from there. But in terms of the way we engage, it could be from supporting like functioning of basic services, including in this case creating a school or health services, up to what you call it intervention on economic activity so that especially the refugee which is going to live longer in that area will need to have a job to do and that will create quite a lot of implication. So the the intervention can be a very more focusing on a humanitarian side for, for example, food, shelter, and so on, which is usually that's heavy on the UN side, up to more medium long term, the need to have a basic services up to the economic activity, and even sometimes institutional and governance issue, because then you are dealing with the local government or any organization that need to be strengthened in order for them to be able to continue manage that kind of population. I think on the second question is, is a very interesting. With this new institution, AIB, or even with the other regional development bank, the option is it can be like co-financing or you do the parallel financing. Because they have a totally different in terms of the procurement and so on. I mean, for, and this is also then linked to the question whether the procurement policy of the bank or our safeguard policy in this case is going to be acceptable or compatible or they are going to be like adopting us. The more that we can influence and they are adopting us, then we are going to be able to do the co-financing. I mean, we have the CASA 1000 in which we have regional development like ADB, we have Islamic Development Bank is doing, we have many other project in which we really collaborate in one project in which we are going to co-finance with one procurement system, one safeguard system. If they cannot do it in that way, the alternative is going to be like parallel financing. You can do it now and then they are, can actually do it with other part, which is a totally different procurement they are going to be. And that is uh, something which I think we will be very open in uh, actually exploring. With the AIB, actually, we are actually working and engaging very closely. Not only that in terms of they're designing their institution now, and they try to learn from the bank and try to pick the best of the bank and what is maybe the, the not, not good part, they, they try to not going to import. So if they look at our HR policy, they look at article of agreement, they look at our safeguard policy, procurement policy. Amazing that for a new institution, you have the luxury as well as the ability to learn so that you can pick the, the good part of it and leave behind maybe. And that's really healthy for institutions like us because then you say that we are talking to our shareholder and the client. See, if we make our institution as always complicated as possible, then we are end up with just not reforming ourselves. But see, the new institution can actually design in a much more 
free way because they are, don't have legacy issue. So they can become a real good competitor in creating a pressure of benchmark for us. So I think that's really a very good one. And I, I really like look forward to have this new operation for them starting January. Um, many of the project, even for the bank now, our new vice president that is East Asia and South Asia, is starting to come up with a list of projects that they can actually say that we've already prepared this project. Do you want to finance it? Because sometimes the project is just too big for our own financing is not going to be adequate. So we look forward and we even want to, okay, this is a project which is very critical for a country, whether you're talking Pakistan, Afghanistan, or you're talking about Indonesia or other, you want to co-finance with us. And that means that we are going to use the same procurement and you're, you're using the same safeguard. I think I, I'm not really sure what is your question on the last one on the, the change of the way we are going on the climate change. But the climate change has been recognized widely. Many countries is already putting in a more like a mainstream, the policy. I was finance minister of Indonesia, so I was the one who actually initiated the first time climate finance and finance minister meeting discussing about climate change. Because in the past, climate change is always the debate among the environmental minister and the minister of finance know nothing about this. It seems like the financing became very critical. Now I can see that many client countries really mainstreaming. Many of the minister of finance talking about climate change which is built in within their own fiscal policy, which is good. But as I said, the way that the bank work with the client is actually partnering quite a lot. If you're talking from the project design up to the policy level, you talk about fuel subsidy in this case. This is an area that we are working because we 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 we, f we think that this is really a quick win, especially when the oil price now is very low. We are talking about renewable project. We are talking about effectiveness of the uh, the power system or the energy system in a country because a lot of ways in which you actually can reduce the emission. So. I, I don't know whether I answer your question, but I think a, a lot of variety that we are doing as an institution, and we know that this is not only the bank, so we work very closely with many other institutions as well as with the client country. So let me, um, and I'm, I'm tempted, but I'm not gonna get you into trouble by pushing you to identify the not good parts uh, <laughs> uh, that the bank currently has, but um, it does strike me, it's so, you know, we got a flavor in the safeguard. You had some discussion of safeguards here, and these are hugely um, complex issues. Getting simply getting political buy-in around the principles and objectives is challenging, and then there's sort of oper oper operationalizing them. And you know, frankly, on that part of it, you know, for often for borrowing countries, they they look at it dismissively as the hassle factor. I mean, how hard is it to deal with the bank and navigate the bank? What, what would you say, I mean, from your perspective, you were a bank client country, you, you were the finance minister, you led the engagement. Uh, is the bank easier to deal with today than it was when you were finance minister? <laughs> today we haven't changed. We have procurement just passed, which is starting January. So in terms of what you call it, the two thing procurement and safeguard, five years ago and now it's no different. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so I cannot argue that the bank now is more difficult than five years ago or five years ago more difficult than now because there is no really change. But there is quite a lot of innovation on the instrument and I said like P4R, which is really recognizing the country own system. So um, I think the bank is very responsive. Um, the bank on the, it's, it's sometimes being perceived as slow uh, that when I'm now become part of the management I know why it is slow because our staff our team sometimes really have to consult with everybody I mean and that's why as, as I said earlier being owned by 188 country give you a huge power but create you a lot of with complication I mean I wish you have only one shareholder in which I can say like, can you do that and that's it we're not we're dealing with 188 which is 25 sitting board, so you really, I mean, even yesterday we jokingly in the board and asking, 
even a simple thing in the bank can be complicated because it's the way we we org we govern, right? So that's why I think the good part about today is the board management. We are all wonder, okay, because this institution is a big owned by 188, we can easily always make an excuse that this is an, a complicated institution. It's just impossible to run and manage. But if you want to do that with, that is also can happen. It happened. But we can also make the, well, we can really try to find what is the conversion. So on a safeguard, I think you are dealing with like three th level, right? The aspiration principle level, there is a policy and the guideline. Each of them has a different implication in terms of the way this is need to be implemented in the project level. So whatever that we are going to see within this kind of context of discussion, whether issue a human right and other, you are going to where they are going to be put within this bank framework. And I think no one in this world, any country who will actually have, it's not about the courage or even have the ability to stand saying that mm, I'm not going to respect human rights. I don't think so. But the question is that, what does it mean when you are putting in your policy in this case? Uh, so, and the bank business in this case, we are dealing with the government. The client is the government. It's a sovereign country. Then that in itself is telling a lot about this is not a normal business in the way that. It's not like you take it or you leave it. This is a long-term relationship. So you have to make it work. So I, I must say after five years joining the bank and in this position, I would say that you can always make an excuse every time I wake up in the morning and say, oh, I always make an excuse that this is complicated, so let those problem there. No one is going to solve it. People will always uh, complain about it, but you just listen to that complaint and it will go on with life. Or you try to solve it one by one and you try to make a convergence. And I choose the second one. I think I'm more, maybe you can say it pragmatic, but I also believe that this pragmatism is not totally pragmatism. It's really guided by the principle that I believe is good serving this institution, especially serving our client country and the shareholder if you wish. We have just a few minutes left. I wonder if there are any, well, you had your hand up earlier, one here and one there. We'll have to leave it there. Uh, right in the front row, this woman. Hi, um, Sarah Orzel from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I'm wondering now that the SDGs have been agreed upon, if you will be reconsidering the uh, way that you define poverty in your first goal to be more inclusive of something like multidimensional poverty and not just focused on income. And then right back here. I'm Ed Elmendar, formerly with the World Bank. I want to push you further on the question of resources. If we look seriously at the new sustainable development goals, the resource requirements are almost unimaginable. How is the World Bank going to face that, and, and how is it going to work with its clients on that particular problem? While simultaneously the bank is also challenged by a subject that wasn't even mentioned this afternoon, namely global public goods. The World Bank should be the prime international instrument for the international community for financing global public goods. It's not even on the agenda. Uh, where is Ida with this? What's going to happen on global public goods? Thank you. Okay. The first one, maybe um, uh, it's easier because we are working on it. I think the bank now internally we are talking and uh, the DAC and our uh, global practice on economics is uh, developing this multidimensional poverty, so uh, it's on their way. How this is going to implicate the goals that we are having, especially when we are talking about declaring eradicating poverty by 2030 based on 125, 1.25 uh, dollar per day. I think the second question is really a heavy question. I mean. That can be a discussion with a shareholder and many <coughs> things. Um, but the first one, the SDG, we, we, 
we we actually issue this what we call it from billion to trillion. I mean, and there is no one claim that the SDG need to be financed through the ODA. It's not. I mean, and that's why I think the resources which is needed to achieve this SDG is a combination between their country-owned resources, the private sector, then the international institution like us and others in a way. Um, the question now for, for any country or any, any player, if you have one dollar, how you are going to spend, especially if you, want, you have one dollar to spend to support the SDG, how you are going to spend it that will have the highest impact and maybe the highest leverage. And the institution like us can provide you with, it, with that kind of choice. You want to do it through your bilateral, you want to do it through your, I don't know, through the private sector, you are going to combine, that kind of thing is going to be a choice. The bank will work from multi-front. First on a resource mobilization, as uh, Jim, uh, uh, President Kim uh, speech this morning, we are working with the IMF, really like focusing on this, the resource mobilization, the, the tax collection, the revenue. And it is also uh, in the G20 has been discussed as a highest priority. I was finance minister, so I sympathize and really have a huge expectation and high hope on that. Because many finance ministers really see that their ability or inability to collect revenue, not only that they have a corrupt official, weak legal system, weak tax law, but sometimes really also related to that, the fact that company can easily just evade the tax. They can easily escape, they can avoid. So, and you can easily frustrate because it's sometimes the country next door or the country over there. And, and they can, I mean, many of my friends is coming from that. So if this has become an international commitment, then the ability is going to be for for their finance minister to reform their tax department, to improve their institution, to eradicate corruption, to improve legislation, while at the same time international to support. Private sector is very critical. And I know the bank is a one word bank group. We have IFC, we have MEGA. So we work really very closely with them. And we offer this one word bank group. I think uh, on the global public goods, I fully support that. Uh, the issue about this Ebola is global public bad, global public good, and institution like us is like climate change. That's exactly. There is a, uh, the recognition is one thing. And the second one is in terms of whether the institution like us really fit for that kind of issue. And then whether the financing and the governance fit with that kind of mandate. I think that is more or less the issue. And then you are touching the issue, including the IDA. I mean, this is exactly what we are now discussing with the board about the reform of whole the funding and financing of the bank. The IDA, both using the balance sheet of the other, I accumulated that we've already have so far with the equity and the leverage, which is below one, with the IBRD in which we can actually leverage by five times because we have the equity lending ratio by 20%, and then, then combine it with the IFC. That create an option, but I think Scott knows very well, I read a lot of his writing from this institution, which is I think the issue of, the, touching the issue about the funding mechanism, governance of the institution, two different balance sheet, two different board, but they actually the same 25 that I chair every two weeks, uh, uh, two, two times a week. They now I that, and then next hour the IBRD, and next hour they become IFC. But they actually represent a three different balance sheet, three different governance. I think you can make it a little bit simple. I mean, by by ha having a, a reform on that, both on the funding, governance structure, so that allow us as an institution to be much, much more effective. So I hope that's answer your question. Um, so thank okay. you very much. Yes, yeah, so, so thank you. That was a remarkable number of topics you covered <laughs> very efficiently. So please join me in thanking her.